This is the 83rd Annual Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Symposium, Brains and Behavior, Order and Disorder in the Nervous System. My name is Rebecca Leshen. I'm the director of the Banbury Center here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And I'm very pleased to be here today to close out the symposium with Ed Boyden, who's a professor at MIT um, and who has winner of the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, um, arguably for the hot topic of the symposium, optogenetics. I'm so glad to be here with you today, Ed. Thank you for being here. Great to be talking to you too, Rebecca. I wonder if you could give us a quick snapshot of your research, maybe a preview of what you're going to be speaking about today. Sure. Well, if we want to understand the brain, we have three technological needs. To see what's going on in the brain right. with high-speed precision, mm -hmm. to map the molecules and the organization of the brain, right. and to control the high-speed dynamics. Mm -hmm. So we've been working a lot on extending uh, tool sets into these three directions. Uh, for control, we've been trying to perfect optogenetic mm -hmm. uh, control of neurons, and also to develop non-invasive ways to focus the effects of electricity deep in the brain. For mapping the brain, we've been working on ways to physically blow up the brain until it's up to a thousand times bigger in volume mm. so that you can map the very physically. finest connections. That's right. So we can mm. take a, a piece of brain tissue and magnify it physically. It grows before your very eyes until it could be a thousand times or more larger in volume. And this is expansion microscopy. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And then finally, to watch the high-speed dynamics of the brain, we've been trying to work out basically the opposite of optogenetics. Can mm. you get neurons to report their electrical activity in the form of light? Mm. And that's a hard problem. So we've been yes. developing... Uh, robots that can do directed evolution and make these molecules in the laboratory. Oh my goodness. And what you do feels so different from a, what a lot of researchers are doing because you don't, from my impression, have a specific <laughs> disease state that you're, you're focused on. You're really about developing tools and that is has such huge impact on the field because, I mean, as we've seen, almost every presentation here is using those. How does that differ in the way that you approach a research topic or the field? Well, we don't focus on a single disease because we want to solve all of them. Right. <laughs> and um, I thought a lot about the different diseases and also basic science questions, like mm -hmm. what is memory or how does a decision take place? Right. And it was very clear that there's so many problems. Mm -hmm. And so our strategy is often to take a step back. What's the underlying problem that if we solved it, would solve all these other problems? Wow. And so by building these tool sets and then giving them out to thousands of groups, we do some basic science in our group, but most of the work we do is either collaborative or through teaching the tools right. to other people. We think we can help solve all these problems uh, over an extended period of time. And that really fits with your training because you started as an engineer, is that right? Which, which I yeah. think of as what can we build or how can we build it? Well, I started my training in chemistry and oh. then, uh, for two years, um, working on, a, on an origins of life project of mm. all things. And then I switched schools and started uh, studying physics and electrical engineering. Mm. Um, and by that point, I knew a lot of stuff, but I needed a really good problem to work on. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like the brain... I was always very <laughs> philosophically inclined ever since I was a kid, mm -hmm. had you know, real consequences for right. understanding the human condition, but there are also lots of practical things we could do if we could help heal the sick or prevent disease. Right. And so this also not only spans a lot of disease states, but you're spanning a lot of model organisms and even hopefully <coughs> for the future to think about humans. Mm -hmm. How has that been difficult or has that been an easy transition between different types of models? Well, the basic science we do, you know, thinking like a physicist, is all on mm. very small organisms. I would love to solve a simple organism like the worm C. elegans mm. or a larval zebrafish over the next, you know, five to 15, who knows how many years it'll take to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as building tools that everybody can use, we do our own human experiments. We do our own mouse experiments, and we try to really validate these technologies in a wide variety of species so that, you know, everybody, uh, as many people as you can anyway, can use our technologies. And that, I mean, it's so um, refreshing in line with thinking about everybody being able to use your technologies. You have, in a remarkable way, been very open with all of your protocols and your technologies, getting things out there even before they're published sometimes. Is that a philosophy you've always had or is that something new what, as you became a PI? Well, I think it's kind of the obvious path. If you build a tool mm. and nobody uses it, what's the point? <laughs> That's so, true. Um, you know, we've always had the policy of giving out everything for free to academics mm. and nonprofit scientists and so forth. And, and uh, I, that's both charitable, but it's also self-interested. You know, mm. again, what's the point of our existence if we don't do anything useful? Well, I mean, I could see it being a different hyper-competitive, keep everything close until the big nature paper comes out. But I mean, that is the basis of science. So that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So. 
<coughs> have you seen, has there anything at the symposium surprised you? Is there anything that has really inspired you here, or e even if it's, if not here in the field today, that's really exciting you outside of your own work? Oh, yeah, lots of things. I feel like that there's a lot of interesting physics that's being discovered about the mm. brain, you know, uh, at the symposium, but also. Um, in many groups, we're hearing about new forms of energy, like ultrasound and other mm. ways of interfacing to the brain, mm -hmm. um, using clever and novel strategies from different parts of, of science. Right. Um, I also think there's a real interesting connection that's forming between really the basic science and the translational side. So hearing about people's right. studies um, about how you know, mapping the brain can lead to new targets for treating depression with electrical stimulation. Right. Um, you know, these kinds of topics really show the power, not just of technology, but bridging mm -hmm. the science translational gap through mm. real experiments and real results. And so you are collaborating with clinicians in some of the work that you do, is that right? Oh, a lot, yeah. Mm. So we've given our tools to literally thousands of groups at this point. Right. Um, we have close collaborations with maybe like a hundred groups where like wow. we really work side by side with people. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, you know, later today I'll talk about a way of non-invasively stimulating the human brain mm. through focusing electric fields through some clever tricks that we stumbled across. Wow. And we're working now with a number of people, uh, in fact we've had requests now from dozens and dozens of groups to collaborate to try to apply this to different kinds of diseases, wow. ranging from Alzheimer's to tinnitus to depression and uh, everything in between. So how much interaction do you have with industry? Because what you're doing is very innovative and I can imagine a lot of <coughs> industry, a lot of biotech and pharma companies are very interested. Yeah, we've done technology transfer to a lot of pharmaceutical companies, mm. device companies, um, several startup companies are also uh, licensing technology from us, all the way from discovery to treatments. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also spun out several companies of our own. I co-founded uh, with uh, Professor Li Wei Sai at MIT, a company mm -hmm. to try to develop um, basically media that you could watch or hear to treat Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Um, she talked about the, some of this work earlier in the symposium. Mm -hmm. um, and we have other projects too, like this expansion method. You know, if you want to detect diseases early, mm -hmm. and I think something like eight out of the top 10 leading causes of death, if you can catch the diseases earlier, you can help people more. Mm. So what's the problem with detecting disease early? Well, it's very subtle, the changes that right. occur early in a disease. Right. So this expansion method where we blow up a piece of tissue a thousand times mm. or more, um, you know, if you could use that to blow up, for example, a cancer biopsy and diagnose it earlier, oh, that's not good. Oh, that's benign. Right. That could really help save a lot of lives. So we spun that out as a company as well. Wonderful. So uh, I know this <coughs> symposium is really about um, neuroscience and brains, but have you thought about tools for other fields like immunology mm -hmm. or is that, or are you squarely staying within the brain? Well, you know, the brain is like a mountain. You just mm -hmm. climb to the top is a long road. Mm -hmm. And along the way, there's lots of points in time where you can kind of spin out other kinds of projects. So last year, for example, we published mm -hmm. our first paper in the field of cancer biology. Mm -hmm. It didn't mention the brain once. Oh, and uh, we actually showed that, uh, you know, we worked with some pathologists from Harvard Medical School, mm -hmm. and we showed that if we expand um, human uh, breast cancer biopsies, mm. which pathologists disagree about the diagnosis up to half the time, mm -hmm. we could actually help train a machine learning algorithm better to discriminate between these different cases from benign to something that one might worry about. Wow. So we're finding that, you know, the brain is so complex that if you build a tool that can mm -hmm. confront the complexity of the brain, it might be able to help solve a lot of other problems as well. So, I mean, your background is, is quite varied, and I think the way that you approach problems reflects that interdisciplinary thinking. Mm -hmm. Do you also expect that of those you train? Is that an advantage to you? Or, you know, if somebody came in and said, I've studied neuroscience my entire career and I want to work with you, you know, is that, is that off-putting? I think to really see if somebody can innovate well, you kind of have to watch them in action. Mm. We have a grad student in my group um, who's working on a really cool project his professional training was, um, uh, he was a photographer. He was actually a professional <laughs> photographer. Really? Um, but if you're wow. you know, a, a classically trained photographer, you know a lot of chemistry too, right? Yeah. How to develop pictures sure. and so forth. And so he's now leading one of our most um, uh, sort of out of the field projects. Wow. Um, we even have two graduate students. I don't know if there's any other group at this symposium uh, mm -hmm. with this property. We have two graduate students uh, who never finished college. You know, they dropped out. Wow. And, um, it became pretty clear that they could you know, mm -hmm. have a lot of problem solving skills though and, mm -hmm. and uh, they're now both leading projects that are quite exciting. Well, so I really I... think you have to understand how people think and there's a lot of emotional mm -hmm. components to being an innovator as well. Mm. Um, a lot of our technologies, once we have figured out how to create them, which requires a lot, a lot of failure and a lot of sort of wisdom gathering through failure, mm -hmm. once we understand the problem at a deeper level, mm -hmm. uh, the technologies are not so hard to build. It's the understanding of the problem at a deep level that's so difficult. Wow. It, so, you mentioned having failures along the way. What has been the biggest hurdle that you've overcome or what is still the biggest hurdle for you in the work that you're doing? 
Well, I've looked back at our group's work over the last 12 years, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a model of innovation that I think emerges, which really mm -hmm. has failure as an integral part of it. Mm. So step one is to pick a really big problem to work on. And I mm -hmm. think all the big problems are pretty obvious, like let's see what's going on in the brain, or let's control everything in mm -hmm. the brain. The second step is to think backwards from that problem and survey all the different disciplines of science and engineering and try to systematically think of how we would go about solving it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually kind of the approach that Carl Dysroth and I applied when we started thinking of optogenetics. Mm -hmm. We just started thinking about mechanical and optical and electrical and magnetic and just started to go through all the laws of physics, trying to think of the best way to control wow. neural activity. Um, back in the year 2000, actually, when we were both students. Oh my goodness. So I really think that one can be very systematic and having interdisciplinary training can help with that. Okay. Step three is what I call constructive failures. So mm. we try things out and a lot of it will fail. Mm -hmm. But they'll show us things that nobody's seen before. They'll show us uh, right. what you might call wisdom, you know, this kind of elusive appreciation mm -hmm. of reality that's hard to get just by thought right. or by reading. Experience. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. step four is design. So we now know the nature of the reality a bit better than before. Mm -hmm. Let's go design the ultimate technology. And so with uh, a lot of our technologies, like expansion microscopy or automatic patch clamping or optogenetics or mm -hmm. voltage imaging and the list goes on, um, we followed something maybe like that pattern. And uh, it allows us to do things that are very orthogonal to what people are doing mm -hmm. because we understand the problem for its own sake at its own level. So that's all, I mean, that's quite methodolo methodological. <coughs> How much, um, of the component of your process involves a little bit of luck here and there. Well, so the wisdom gathering, where we notice things mm. people haven't seen before, I mean, that's obviously serendipitous. Okay. When we did the first optogenetics experiments, um, it basically worked on the first try. We mm -hmm. didn't have to improve the molecules. We didn't have to mutate them. We didn't have to, you know, um, <laughs> they were fast enough and high enough amplitude <sighs> and safe enough that they worked on essentially the first try. That never happens. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of luck that's involved. Yeah. Uh, but I think that that's, you know, you can optimize your luck. So sometimes I, claim that uh, what we're trying to do is serendipity engineering. Can mm. we do on purpose what otherwise might be taking a long time if it's only accidental? It sounds very, uh, your description of the process and the failures sounds very much like the entrepreneurial spirit where you know you see um, startups coming through <coughs> and there's a certain level of failure. You need to have certain startups have failed to gain that experience in the world. I know you teach some courses that have an entrepreneurial component, is that right? I teach one class with the MIT Business School. Mm. Yeah. And is there, you know, are, is this method part of what you're imparting on your students or is that a completely separate? Um... Well, I think there's an attitude to failing fast. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure that's exactly what I believe in. I believe more in you learn through the failure and that pivots into the real solution. Okay. And uh, it's not that, so I, in some ways I don't think it's a failure per se, it's just that you have to learn before you can succeed. Mm -hmm. And the learning requires you to do things that would cause you to fail. Okay. But I don't think it's a failure per se because at the end it actually is a success. That's a really great attitude. <laughs> and most of the great technologies you could argue are failure reboots, right? Mm. I mean, uh, sure. you know, uh, there are lots of examples where something didn't quite work mm -hmm. and then somebody, you know, hey, computers are faster nowadays. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, we have better genome sequencing. And right. now suddenly what was a bad idea has turned into a good one. Mm -hmm. So I've heard a story that the, the sort of <coughs> seminal experiment in the optogenetics work, you had started at 1 a.m. You had started, <laughs> is that, please tell me that's not true. It is true, yeah. Well, uh, the way we divvied up the labor was Carl Dyseroth did the transfections of the genes. Okay. And then I was patch clamping them and shining the light on the cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it more or less worked on the first try. And do you think uh, he did that on purpose, leaving your part until 1 a.m.? <laughs> Oh, that's just when I had time on the rig. That wasn't oh. him. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was doing the, the, the work actually in Richard Chen's group, my thesis ah. advisor group. So this is before Carl had, was a professor. Right, okay. Yeah. And do I have it right that this was sort of your side project initially? It was, yeah. It was sort of an independent side project. Uh, we actually published the first optogenetics paper mm. two months before I turned in my PhD thesis with uh, Richard Chen and Jennifer Raymond, which mm. is all about cerebellum dependent motor learning. Wow. Um, so yeah, then things kind of took off. I found, myself, I found myself applying for faculty jobs just weeks after turning in my thesis. So. And I have another maybe misconception to clear up. Is it true that that, that first paper was rejected by Science and Nature? It was, yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, that's a, I, that's a great thing to put out there that, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Nature Neuroscience is pretty, uh, you know, pretty high up there, but, yeah, and yeah. it's now, now more than 10 years, 2005, is that right? That's right, yeah. And it, it just strikes me at this, at this meeting how much everyone's presentations, are you getting people coming up to you, new trainees and students, and, and wanting to talk to you about what's next? Oh yeah, well optogenetics as a tool set has been becoming mm. pretty mature. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's obviously some things that still have to be improved, but most of the tool set's in pretty good mm -hmm. state right now. But, uh, you know, optogenetics by itself doesn't solve the brain. I think mm -hmm. we have to also get those really good molecular and wiring maps of the brain. And we also mm -hmm. really need to have good high-speed imaging of the dynamics of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so um, almost all of our effort on technology, anyway, is focused on those two areas. Why can't we see, uh, why can't we evolve um, all sorts of fluorescent indicators of every neural signaling pathway? Mm -hmm. And through these robotic, and now we're starting to work in artificial intelligence methods to help us as well, can we actually start generating in a systematic way new kinds of fluorescent reporter? Mm. Um, and then for imaging the wiring, we're getting a lot of uh, technologies based upon our expansion method ho that hopefully will allow people to routinely extract diagrams of the wiring of the brain. So I'm glad you mentioned artificial intelligence. Do you think that, uh, you know, <coughs> discovering more about the human brain is able to inform the development of artificial intelligence? Um, how much are you getting from the reverse, learning from artificial intelligence and um, processes that are being built on their own? Is there is there stuff, things that you're taking away from that? Yeah, well, you know, if we have, what, 30,000-ish genes in the human genome, and mm. who knows how many hundreds or thousands of cell types in the body, mm -hmm. um, these data sets are obviously gonna be very large. Mm -hmm. And if we wanna have a full map of the human brain, just back of the envelope, if we were to map one human brain, just one, yeah. and digitize it with single molecule resolution and put them, the data on little hard drives mm. and stack them up, that the, the tower of hard drives would reach into outer space from the Earth's <sighs> surface. So that's just one brain too. Yeah. So we're definitely going to need new kinds of algorithmic thinking, and we're mm -hmm. starting to use quite a bit of that in evaluating the kinds of data we're getting. Wonderful. Well, we have to get you over to give your talk. Thank Great. you so Thank much you. for taking the time to, to sit down with me, and we're so glad you're here. Great. Yeah. Thank really you. Really good talking to you, too.